Well, good evening. I'm Alex Wolf, and I serve as the Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. And it's uh, my great pleasure to welcoming you to this event. Um, I've been looking forward to it for, for a while now. Um, and, you know, we've got some really interesting people to hear from tonight. So, uh, so let's get this started. Um, this is, a, this is a really great place, Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's home to a lot of um, innovation. And it's also home to this facility here, which is, um, which is part of the University of California, Santa Cruz. And, and it's actually a place where quite a bit of AI research goes on. We have eight faculty and about 30 PhD students down the hallway here and upstairs there, um, who uh, very much are, are focused on a variety of issues around artificial intelligence um, and the implications, importantly, for society. Um, I also want to mention that Baskin Engineering is a place that has been involved with artificial intelligence for decades. Uh, some of the earliest work on the formal foundations of machine learning actually happened within our school. And we're very, very, very proud of that work. Um, it was foundational in, in the formation of a field that, that really has exploded. And uh, in my time um, in the field, I'm a computer science professor, uh, I've witnessed, I, I, I sort of observed this thing machine learning and artificial intelligence somewhat from a distance. I'm a systems person. But I've also seen it develop from incredibly primitive technology. I mean, incredibly primitive technology to something that now is, is in discussion in people's homes. And to me, that that's, that's an incredible evolution uh, and something that we really need to understand as a, as a society. Um, engineering has other such technologies that have, in, have infused itself, infused themselves into society. And we as, as engineers take very seriously what that means. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to maybe, maybe hear some thoughts about that. And uh, I'm sure that, that our speakers tonight are also very engaged with those questions. Um, so really what I would like to do, though, is I'd like to introduce our chancellor, Chancellor Reeve. Uh, Cindy is, uh, has been our chancellor for five years. Um, she's pri prioritized student success and research excellence at the university. Um, and she recognizes that the university is a driver of innovation and economic development and has been very supportive of the work that our faculty here in, in Santa Clara and our faculty in Santa Cruz have been doing to uh, advance the technology. Um, she's also provided leadership in a variety of organizations that are related, Internet2, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. So it's my pleasure to welcome Chancellor Cindy Larif. Well, thanks so much, Alex. Welcome, everybody. I'm just delighted that we can host you here at our Santa Clara campus. We're really proud to be home to the, being the UC of Silicon Valley and uh, glad to have you here with us this evening. <clears throat> Last year at this time, I spent very little time thinking about artificial intelligence. I'm a chemist by training, and that might be true for some of you, too. But now it's one of the things that comes up multiple times every day, every day uh, for me. And um, it's hard to think of a new field that has exploded as quickly as this one. And it has such wide ranging potential, you know, from higher education, technology, business, art, science, the full range of human endeavors. The emergence of chat GPT and other generative AI applications 
has truly created an inflection point for all of us. It's hard to overstate AI's potential impacts. Many we have yet to fully realize. There are also probably some things that we have to worry about a little bit, but I think that too will get a handle on over time. But I'm so pleased to have with us today three people who are much more qualified than I am to speak about AI, its uses, its potential to change the world for the better, and its potential hazards. And I'm honored to introduce and excited to hear from tech guru Guy Kawasaki. Guy is also joined by technology and finance expert Jeremiah Oyang and UC Santa Cruz computer science and engineering professor Luca D'Alfaro. So Guy, how do I best describe you? I think it's ubiquitous. <laughs> An author, entrepreneur, startup advisor. He is the former chief evangelist of Apple. He's currently the chief evangelist of the online design and visual communication company, Canva. Guy has, uh, is the host of a popular par podcast called Remarkable People. If you haven't listened to it, I think you'd enjoy it. In his podcast, Guy interviews a diverse group of people who I find inspirational. His latest book, his 16th book, wow. Be Remarkable, draws on his expertise and experience in these interviews to provide a roadmap for personal and professional growth. A remarkable person in his own right, Guy is a good friend of UC Santa Cruz. He has a BA from Stanford and an MBA from UCLA and an honorary doctorate from Babson College. So thank you, Guy, thank for helping you. to conceive of tonight's panel discussion. Thank you. Am I supposed to go up now? <clears throat> you can wait and I'll introduce okay. your colleagues and then you can all join together if that's okay. okay. Uh, Jeremiah is a VC, a founder, a CMO, an industry analyst and a public speaker who is passionate about discover discovering technology trends. He explains them and then he helps to deploy them worldwide. He's a general partner at Blitz Scaling Ventures and leads an AI investment fund. Jeremiah is a graduate of San Francisco State and has continued his education through Stanford Continuing Studies. And finally, Luca is a longtime faculty colleague at UC Santa Cruz, and his time on, on our campus pre predates ChatGPT by two decades. <laughs> that makes me feel better. Arriving in 2001, he's long worked at the foundations of formal verification, contributing to the connection between game theory, logic, automata theory, and system modeling and verification, and his current re research focuses on fairness in AI and the use of AI in education and on computational ecology, in particular, the use of machine learning techniques for the study of animal habitats. He was an undergraduate student in Torino, Italy, one of my favorite cities, and then a master's and PhD student at Stanford. And following that, he was a postdoc at UC Berkeley. So I'll ask you all to come, come to your chairs, and I will turn it over to you, Guy. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. Oh, thank you very much for coming. So um, I recently moved to Santa Cruz, so um, my, my heart lies in Santa Cruz as opposed to San Francisco. <laughs> Certainly not Palo Alto. So that's, <laughs> that's where I'm coming from these days. And uh, I've been happy to help UCSC. I, I have kind of feel like I have a moral obligation to help whatever school is in the area. So that's my connection to UCSC. Um, my first question for both of you is, if you could just briefly describe the lens that you bring to this session. Like, what should people know about you? We, re we heard your bio, but like, what's your shtick vis-a-vis -vis AI? 
Uh, well, difficult question. So, uh, how do I use AI? I use it actually, I've been worried about using it in teaching. Uh, we have a system now that gives uh, feedback to students about their homework in AI. We're just starting, so we, we don't know yet how useful it is and whether we need to fine tune it. Um, and otherwise, I spend a lot of time thinking uh, about, uh, well, computational ecology, which doesn't have a lot to do per se with uh, language models, but it tells you about the relations of uh, power and evolution and the role of AI that might have in the society and what may happen and uh, how to think at uh, the disruption it may bring. Okay. Jeremiah. Yes, yeah, so I do a couple things. Um, I run an AI event series in San Francisco called Llama Lounge. Um, it's also sometimes in Palo Alto. Um, <laughs> the last event we had, it was at Hana House. There was uh, 400 people in attendance. The, the line was down the street. It was the largest tech event since the iPhone launch. It was unbelievable how many people showed up. Um, most of the, the events that I host, 1,300 people apply to attend. We have 10 different AI startups demoing. So I'm, I'm helping to bring the AI community together. So just, but that also helps me to invest and find the right startups. So my job is to find the AI startups that are gonna be the next big winners and give them money and we take some equity and we guide them towards profitability. Well, uh, to put it mildly, to give you my lens, I, I'm mostly a writer and a podcaster. And I will tell you, there are people who like to hide the fact that they use AI because somehow, you know, my, you might think it's cheating if I use it to help my writing and podcasting. I have no such qualms. I use ChatGPT, Claude, Bot, and Quillbot every day, every day multiple times, and there's no doubt in my mind that it has improved me as a writer and a podcaster. And I would say once a day, I say to myself, how did I ever do this before? Like, how did I do this? Like, what, what miracle there is that this is? So, as you can tell, I'm generally positive about this. Now, I'd like to ask the two of you, based on, you know, your particular lens, what keeps you up at night about AI? Is there anything that's like this haunting, gnawing fear about what AI may bring to society? Well, I, 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 see, I see this in a different way from perhaps most. Uh, there is a lot of this idea that there is we and AI as if we are on the same level. And here I have a different idea. AI is on another level of organization. AI, for example, if you look at it, uh, it cannot reproduce by itself, right? So it needs us <laughs> to reproduce. So language models are created by humans. So it's, it's more, I, uh, my, my joke is that we're, it's not a joke. We are more like the phenotype of AI or of society rather than competing at the same level. AI needs us in order to reproduce. And we are sensitive to the um, to the system of incentives that are created by society in general and in the future more and more by AI. Um, I have this very, uh, very rude joke, okay, but, uh, l but let me say it nevertheless. You know, look at like, a Silicon Valley company. What are they doing? They're feeding the AI instead of reproducing. And this, uh, this seems like a joke, right? Because I'm sort of uh, saying, you know, yeah, they work too much. But the idea is deep. Uh, tell me another animal species uh, that uh, favors uh, to their own uh, procreation uh, the development of another form. It's not, it's not, you will have a, a bit of difficulty finding it. So what keeps me awake at night, I mean, I'm not, not that worried about it, but it's essentially the, the shifting system of incentives and the greater organization that uh, AI will bring, uh, not as something that competes with us directly, but as something that is one level up in the organization and of which we will be more like, you know, the phenotype, the, the proteins of what the, the AI will be the DNA. Okay. Um, generally agree with those comments. Um, I do think that AI will be disrupting society pretty significantly. And uh, I'm not really clear on how I should raise my children. And I'm in the field full time. And I talk to the leaders. I know the CEOs. They don't really know either. Um, and the economic systems and the way society is set up is not set up for, I think, what is going to happen. So if you look at most of the forecasts, most jobs will be impacted. That's the term they're using now to soften the blow, impacted or exposed. 
That's the term, exposed to AI, which sounds really nasty, by the way, worse. Uh, so it, the, most of the forecasts predict in, in about a decade from now, 30 to 40% of roles and tasks will be exposed to AI. Can you imagine what 30 to 40% of potential unemployment looks like to society? We wouldn't function. There would literally be warfare in the streets. So is this president, the next president, are they ready to make those changes? Is Congress ready? Does Congress understand AI? So I think there's some big societal changes that are coming that we just are not ready to move fast enough. Back to you, hi. Well, I mean, <laughs> Jeremiah, uh, I'm much older than you. My, my children are 19, 20, I can't even remember anymore. 19, 21, 28, and 30, you know, okay. And I just want to point out to you that when your kids are like 10, 11, right? 11 and 5. Yeah. So when my kids were your, your kids' age now, and I was a parent, I didn't know how to raise them either. So it's not like, oh, God, for, uh, until, until ChatGPT came, we all knew how to raise our kids, and then shit, <laughs> ChatGPT happened, and we don't know how to be parents. Yeah, that's true. We've never known how to be parents. Yeah, that's true. So I just think you're more wise. Uh, perhaps you had a way. <laughs> See, you, you, you brought up three words that I have never heard mentioned <laughs> sequentially, <laughs> which is, Fairness in AI. What the hell is fairness in AI? It, it's a good name to raise money. What we actually do is something <laughs> more practical. <laughs> Um, what we do is something much more practical. We look at large data sets so that you may feed it to AI. I think at you know, the set of people speaking into phones in the US. And we, uh, we developed algorithms that are very good at identifying which groups of data behave in an anomalous way. Um, I, I don't know, we can intersect all possible variables. We know, ah, okay, it's, uh, uh, no, you know, the kids uh, between uh, 10 and 15 uh, when they talk with this kind of background noise. And, and if you do this type of things, uh, both, it both gives you a lot of insight into the data and it gives you a lot of insight into how the model works and how to get new data to improve it and these kind of things. So fantasy AI is a sort of you know, a trade name, uh, let's say. <laughs> but what we do is much more algorithms to understand the large data sets in a very efficient way so to, to know what, to, what behaves in an anomalous way. And in fact, I use it even for other purposes. I, lo I look at you know, admission data from our university, and I find, you know, so who are the students that do, don't perform as well? Uh, you know, what are the groups that, that you know, perform in an anomalous way? You know, it's, it's Jack of all trades uh, <laughs> type of tool. Well, and Jeremiah, I like to point out that none of us said what keeps us up at night is ChatGPT taking over our nuclear missiles and starting a nuclear war. <laughs> now, is that because we don't think that's going to happen, or we don't think ChatGPT will launch nuclear missiles? I mean, why does that not worry you? Because it sure as hell seems to worry the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wired, you know, everybody else. Yeah, so I think that um, businesses are likely to be disrupted. I don't think the nukes in particular are because most of them are using ancient technology intentionally not connected. <laughs> That's reassuring. Well, yeah. no, they're, it's intentionally not connected to the internet, intentionally, right? So, like, they use key systems. For this type of reason. Yeah, but think of the fascists who hold the keys. Well, that's U.S.-based nuclear arsenals, but what we don't is overseas. We're I was describing U.S. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the issue could be data theft. I mean, we're going to see it in this next election cycle. There's going to be significant. I mean, Joe Biden was deep fake last week. Um, Taylor Swift was deep faked yesterday or two days ago. Like that is imminent, and that's more likely. Uh, nuclear explosions everywhere, we're all gone. It's fa so fast. But um, <laughs> not too worried about that. It'll be painless, <laughs> mostly. Um, but the main issue, though, is like what's going to be happening to us in the next few years. And I think those are the things. So um, everybody's voice can be replicated with three seconds of recording. It doesn't have the cadence correct. It, it doesn't, like, you can tell it's not really you but it can simulate lots of messages. I'm getting lots of spam that's getting better and better. It's starting to personalize. Hey, Jeremiah, we're at the museum. We're waiting for you. It's Hannah. Like, I got that yesterday. Not, not great, but uh, months ago, it didn't know my name. So it's getting better and better and better. It's going to be able to simulate. My parents are going to be vectors for that type of attack. So even my family, we, we have to set up a code word system. Before you send money, before you say anything important, like you, all of you need to set up a code word system 
with your family because you're gonna your family's gonna be deep faked. So that is some things that I would. Wait, think wait. About. So you have a code word system so that you wait. don't. <laughs> well, my parents are dead, so they're not gonna be calling me up asking for money. <laughs> but if they kids, did, that would be really impressive. But your actually. kids could like be overseas or something, and and pre it might be calling you. Like so, we need to be ready for all of us. Need to be ready for these uh, vectors. Yeah, I'm much more worried about Silicon Valley Bank disappearing. But yeah, okay, I I could see that fear. Yeah, that that's. Um, I'm interested in asking you, Luca. So, what does teaching computer science mean in AI? I mean, is like are people stopping studying Java and C and all that, and now everything just prompts? I mean, wh what do you study <laughs> in com computer science if in this age of AI? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, it, it, there is an enormous difference in efficiency when you use AI. You know, I compare it to going by foot or going by bike. Uh, when, when I use a copilot, it's as if I am by bike. You know, I'm th roughly 3x faster in writing anything I do. Uh, now, the point is, uh, what does it change the type of notions uh, we have to teach uh, people? That I'm a little bit unclear at the moment, to tell you the frank truth, uh, because uh, th these uh, copilots and various things uh, still spit out nonsense with the same speed at which they spit out wonderful suggestions. <laughs> so if you don't know what's going on, uh, um, you know, uh, and it looks plausible nonsense. So that's the trouble. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you, uh, two years ago, I used to shut it off because uh, it was like having this noisy kid in your ear all the time. You know, I do that, and I would have to stare at it and say, "No, that's, that's complete bullshit." You know, let me do it the right way. Uh, now it's uh, now it has got a lot better in the UI and other things, but. How no, do do people still need, uh, for example, to be able to write code uh, if they don't have an internet connection? I still can do it. I was doing it on, on a plane a few days ago. But do kids need to do that? I would say probably yes, at least to spot the the f uh, as if as you are trained to spot fake news, uh, you will need to be able to spot you know not false suggestions in the code. On the other hand, a lot of other skills will be de-emphasized. For example, uh, you know, you need to memorize a lot less. That's for sure. If you write in English what you want to do, you are going to get good suggestions about how to do it, you know? All this memorization of libraries, AIs, APIs, uh, all that is going to go away. So, um, but I'm struggling with a question, you know? So should we, should we test our kids at, with a paper and pencil exams every now and then just to make sure that they actually know? Um, well, I mean, but you, you could make the non-theoretical argument is, you know, what is knowledge? The fact that with a paper and pencil you can answer a question or with a computer you can answer the question. What's the difference? Uh, maybe there is no difference if you have enough uh, questions so that they can answer with the help of a computer. You could just measure how many of them they get fooled by the computer into the wrong answer. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's a plausible way. Maybe if you would simply have exams so that, uh, that, you know, if you follow the auto com most common completion, <laughs> they lead you astray and we would get, get an equally good measurement of their understanding in after all. So, so Jeremiah, if, if your kids came home and said, Daddy, you know, our assignment is to write a a poem about the sunset. And your daughter said, I'm gonna go to chat GPT and say, I need to write a poem about the sunset. It needs to be 10 lines long, you know, whatever. Would you say, honey, no, 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 you can't do that, that's cheating. Or would you say, God bless you, man, that's the way to future. <laughs> so w we should know how these, to your point, how, how the code functions, how poetry functions. Like she should understand prose and understand rhyme and, and try to really summon that from inside. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not isolating them from technology. Um, even my five-year-olds, they, they see how I'm using it. We use Pi, we use TriPi. That's a very personal AI. Um, my daughter um, in, a, in fourth grade already uses Canva which has generative images, as you probably know. So AI is already in fourth grade. Like, wow, I didn't expect that to happen. Let me interject a small thing about this, you know, generating text with AI. There is a funny consequence that I'm grappling with. That is, we have seen most internet technology make the world smaller and more connected. It's interesting that I think in some ways AI will make the world less connected again. What I mean is this, now when I get an email from a student, 
it's via chat GPT always incredibly well written. When I get a letter from a student who is interested in my research, it basically contains very little information about how the good the student is at writing or reasoning, because it's through chat GPT. Um, there are these deep fakes uh, around. So this means that the value of trust will become larger, and uh, the social circle, you know, I'm not sure that now I would be able to apply from Italy to the US and get admitted to a US school. Because I will be wondering, you know, who's this kid from Italy? Of course, he's using ChatGPT in order to write his essays, you know? And so the essays that got me into Stanford, you know, now <laughs> can we, I mean, they will not trust it. Maybe, yes, if there was a personal connection between Stanford, my professor, and me. But I think we are reverting to a world where the radius of trust is going to be smaller than in the, uh, in the past. So we, the world witnessed maybe 20, 30s of uh, consolidation. It may pull somewhat apart. Well, I mean, so City, you can answer this. So what do you do when you get all these applications that, y you know, 99.9% .9 of the people are using ChatGPT and the other 1% are lying. So <laughs> how do you judge? <laughs> put the chancellor on <laughs> yeah, put me on the hot seat but well so we get a lot of applications and i i think this will be the first season where they're going to go through with high levels of chat gpt essays and so i i think it'll be interesting to see how they sort it out what our what our rubric has been is to look at students achievements in their local context and so students you know, we can look at what they have achieved within the context of their university or, or their high school, I guess. So, you know, there are well-off high schools and less well-off high schools. And if you're at a high school that doesn't offer a bunch of AP courses, your GPA will be lower. We also ask students to write then essays that describe the barriers they've overcome. That's probably the chat GPT part. <laughs> but uh, there has to also be some context for that that then relates to the actual background of the student. So I think it will be very interesting. So yeah. we'll, we'll find out at the end of this admission cycle what the class looks like. But you know my theory, right? Yeah, what's your theory? My theory is you take all the people who applied and you randomly pick and you accept I don't know, whatever the number is, 15,000, figuring that 7,500 goes someplace else. And you just take them by random because I think intelligence and all that good stuff is randomly distributed. So, you know. They just need a stairs. Well, it, it you know, is, you know, I do think that the value of the university is what we do with the students who come, not in the students. Um, they were not an elite school. We accept a lot of California students from high schools around California. And so I think that's the value we provide. So a lottery system, which is sort of what you're describing, uh, might be interesting. I'm going to sit down so you can examine your yeah. panelists. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, let me interject one thing on the idea of the lottery system uh, for the computer scientists among you. I love randomness in algorithms. And they have a, a, a maxim that always paid off. The maxim says, it's better to do stuff at random than to think about it and get it wrong. <laughs> so next time you think at an overcomplicated solution, think whether the randomness one gives you a good enough one. Move because it's speed. often the case. That's how we should pick politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that? I mean, that's like really interesting. Do you believe that? Uh, there, are, there are theories in which you do that, but they, are, you know, they analyze them in no realistic context. I, uh, I, think you know, that I don't know that, uh, that, that it would work incredibly well because, it, uh, yeah. That, that is a startup mindset. Like I hear the founders move and they explore and they iterate and they're trying many different things. For example, some founders just sent me a, a pitch deck this week and they've already inter they've used GPT as part of their product. And so it generates, you, you have a natural language discussion with the GPT and then it spits out and produces a website in like 15 seconds, a full blown website, a full website. Like, I mean, a real working website in 15 seconds. <laughs> so it, it's like they're using these tools and they're just trying it out and they're trying to figure out what sticks. So I'm seeing this already. So ju I just wanna share a stat on what's happening in the AI space, okay? So when I started tracking the space carefully, so it birthed in November, 2022, generative AI, gen AI, that's the, that's the phase. 
in March, there was 3,400 startups. Today, there's 11,500 startups. That's 1,000 new startups per month. There's already been two births since we sat down. <laughs> and, and what are these 1,000 companies doing per month? Every single category, every single industry, every single market, every single geography, every single language, every single persona, they're building AI. And the cost, the cost, the barriers are so low. It's APIs, it's Amazon credits, it's Azure credits. Uh, you don't have to know how to code. So, for example, when I was at the hackathons, I've, so I'm known as one of the most frequent hackathon judges in San Francisco for AI industry. And the, when I show up there, hey, he's hit back again. Um, and, and so I get to see what's happening in 48 hours. So a hackathon is 48 hours. And in March last, last year, people were integrating chat-based AI. So you could have a text-based conversation, a chat bot. In November, just two months ago, I can't begin to tell you, like, they're creating creatures that can see with chat beachy vision. They could analyze the room, say, there's 30 people in this room, 20 of them are men, and the other, and they can analyze it. Then it will have a verbal conversation, it will start to think, and it will interact. It's like, to your point, creating a, another, what, did you, what was the term you used? Being, creature? Yeah, I heard of the Yeah, so I, I've seen <laughs> it go from just text based to having multiple senses and cognitive simulated ability in just nine months. I've never seen this speed before. And I've been here since dot com. So I've been, this is the fifth tech cycle I've seen. This is something different. And if I can add a small riff on what you're saying, there is a super interesting thing about this AI revolution. That is where the value goes. Because uh, I, I used to be a developer. I, I tried to do some startup as well. Uh, and every other API you tried to use was complicated and somewhat proprietary. You know, you started your data in Google, it was stuck into Google. You did this thing with Amazon, it was stuck there. Everything was complicated. Now, with these language models, they have invented the universally easy to use interface. So I, I just built my feedback to students. I can point it to Google model or to uh, uh, ChatGPT or to yet another model. You know, this like a 10 lines of code switch. They have even, and so where does the value go? Well, to NVIDIA, obviously, who builds the in computational infrastructure, I'm less sure it goes to OpenAI or Google. Because if I build an application like mine to give feedback to the students, then I'm going to say, you know, hey, who sells me the language model at the cheapest price? You know, I can play on arbitration. You sell me an expensive one, I don't like yours anymore. I'm going to use hers instead, you know? Uh, and so, uh, and they have huge expenses uh, due to computation, these companies. So I think it's an incredible boom of exactly for what you're doing, for the apps that you build. Because there you can leverage a lot of the value that is specific to the customer you're serving because you use a lot of customer specific knowledge and so you will, you, your companies will not so be so easily replaceable but some of these big providers That's we right. are so excited about at the moment i'm not exactly sure that they will be financially so well off uh, compared to being you know replaceable not utility like but uh, but uh, you know unless they build a big advantage in the quality one compared to the other which is kind of hard to believe uh, then, uh, then it will be more like uh, you know suppliers of an equivalent good hmm. um, do either of you believe that ai is sentient at this point no no i do not and i have a <clears throat> i'm connected to the people that are building these tools and they can confirm it is not. Large language models, the transformers are gluing together words that make sense in a pattern right now. It is pattern matching. It is not sentient. However, those people who I'm talking to, and, and these are the leaders in the AI space, they do think it, we will see AGI in, a, in about a decade. That's way down from the forecast which Ray Kurzweil was forecasting in the 2040s, late 2040s. So that'll be in 2030. So it'll be in our lifetimes that we would likely see that. But there's not going to be a magical date that says, hey, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> because a AGI, of course, would play dumb so you don't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> so think about that tonight. <laughs> so do you think AI is sentient? So the problem is that I don't know what sentience means. So let me tell you a, a true story of me when I was a kid. I got a, a Catholic priest mad at me because I asked the question, well, you know, in the course of evolution, when is it that men started going to paradise? 
Now humanity started going to paradise. They're like, well, in which of the various forks of the monkey family or, you know, whatever <laughs> did we start to going to paradise all of a sudden? And, you know, the, 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 it was a horrible scene, apparently, as people <laughs> tell me. Uh, and I mean, the same is with sentience, right? Uh, you, if you study uh, uh, biology and ecology and these things, you know, there's, a, there's evolution of things. Uh, which is a bacteria sentient? Probably not. Um, mm. And it's simpler than a language model. Are we sentient? Well, you know, probably yes. <laughs> uh, but you know, wh what what is uh, you know at what point? I have no idea. I don't know. I really oh. don't know. I mean, they're certainly complicated enough. But so, it, so there's a question though. There's a sub question. Can it simulate being somewhat alive? And yeah, I think we're just a few years from that. If you if you tried some of the personal AI systems, they're getting really close. Well, I. I don't know about the two of you, but I think it's sentient. I mean, there's, I really do. I, I think it's sentient. I think it's wise. I think it's smarter than me. I, there's no doubt that ChatGPT, Bard, or Claude is smarter than I am. It has Not more knowledge. It has more access to information. It doesn't mean it's smarter than you. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I truly do believe that. I mean, it, it has improved my writing by two or three times, I mean, whole numbers times, not 10%. It, uh, it forces me to be a better, now I don't, I don't just tell ChatGPT, write me a 200 page book about how to be remarkable. <laughs> I mean, I could, but I don't, but, um, but I use it as a research assistant and it definitely comes up with things I never would have come up with that I use. It has made me a better writer and I, I'm proud of it, I mean, I like, I scream it from the mountaintops that um, it's helped me. And of course, I'm the parent that, you know, before, I, I remember these parent-teacher conferences it used to drive me crazy because we'd go in and with my kid and you know, we talked to the teacher and I asked the teacher, why did you tell my kid you can never use Wikipedia? And she said, well, on Wikipedia, anybody can change anything. And I was on the board of trustees of Wikipedia, so I can tell you that is not true. You go and say, I tell you what, tonight you all go home and you say, Planned Parenthood sells baby parts, and see how long that lasts, okay? And so I, I kind of feel like I'm in the same situation now that all my kids are being told you cannot use AI in ChatGPT, we're gonna catch you. And I'm telling them, hey, you're gonna be at a disadvantage. I mean, you have to use this. Um, so maybe I'm an outlier. Well, my kids use AI. Or a ba I'm a bad parent, but... No, but I think we are all telling our kids to use it, right? Yeah. I, I mean, th the most striking experience for me was the following. Um, I, um, I had uh, actually, um, well, maybe if you, uh, somebody asked me a complicated uh, question about a theorem on theory of computation, automata theory. And the, the problem is that they asked me when I was in a hurry to finish something else. So normally I enjoy solving these problems. At that time I couldn't. So I said, okay, what the hell? I just cut and pasted the question as it was directly into uh, chat GPT or Bard. I don't remember which one of the two. Mm -hmm. And I got um, a four paragraph proof in which the fourth paragraph was wrong, but it was wrong in a minor way. You know, this was a thing, well, I can fix it. <laughs> no, and, and so in five minutes, I had a fixed proof. But it was not a trivial theorem. That really took me by, by surprise. So they are at the point in which they can do difficult math, difficult proof of, uh, um, you know, theorems that are non-trivial, that it would probably have taken me 20 minutes or more to figure it out. One of these, you know, regular language uh, theorems uh, about uh, okay. is something regular. You so, J Jeremiah, yeah, maybe you already do this, but do you see the day where you just upload a pitch, and some LLM says, "Fun, no fun, fun, no fun." So we're actually experimenting, as many VCs are, is we use GPTs to go analyze the website and the pitch deck of the startup to see if it matches our thesis. And, but we have to pre-train it on what our thesis is. Fortunately, our thesis is already a book that's been written and it's- Well, what's your thesis? Make lots of money. What, I mean, what else is it? <laughs> well, there's some characteristics that some companies make money better than others. So we would load that and say, how does this match? And then it does go in and look, but it's not accurate right now. 
and it can't really do a good job at, on a founder's evaluation uh, because sometimes for the early stage companies, it's a founder's bet. And sometimes you have to meet them and kind of understand them and why are they motivated and are they going to quit? Are they going to stick with it? And GPT can't figure that out. Huh. So um, uh, I give it a C, but we're in year one and a half. So, I mean, there's a joke amongst the, the VC industry that we're going to automate VCs and whichever VC can automate the startup that, that disrupts the VCs is going to be the rich one. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it, I mean, if you look at the venture capital business, 95% of the time they're wrong, yeah. right? How hard could that be for ChatGPT? <laughs> It's like, I'm a better free throw shooter than Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. Oh, that's saying monkeys, a lot. That's... Monkeys can throw darts more accurately. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be really interesting, and maybe somebody at Wired or CNET or Time or, you know, New York Times is doing this, but to take a thousand business plans and look who got funded, take, stick those same plans into ChatGPT, and 10 years from now, look who picked better. Yeah, <laughs> it would be interesting. I would bet on ChatGPT. <laughs> I would. We should talk about the media landscape, you know, what's happening with New York Times. What, what's that got to do with AI? Well, it's a lot. So New York Times is suing OpenAI right now. Oh, that part. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those dumbasses. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, what's your take? My take is, like, what does the New York Times think it's going to accomplish? Do, do they think that ChatGPT is going to write, create a license for here's a billion dollars because we scraped you? Or New York Times, every time we may have been cited in an answer, we're going to pay you a penny or like, well, what's the end game for you know, New York Times? I have some idea there because, you know, I, I, I was incredibly annoyed at the beginning that, uh, uh, I, even now, that uh, 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 GitHub asks me to pay for Copilot, but it uses my code that I posted there for other reasons, you know, that f to learn from it. And I'm one of the main devel developers of our web uh, framework. And now, you know, if you ask, it spits back code that is mine and the main authors. And, uh, and we didn't put it there for that. So I think there should be a revenue redistribution model at some point. You know, I'm, otherwise, I'm going to change my license on GitHub to all my code that says that you know, training of AI is not. Uh, and I, I don't even know how it squares with the law. Because when I wanted to do some, uh, some research, uh, I was told I cannot simply browse uh, websites uh, in automated ways and download all their information. But they were essentially doing the equivalent, you know? So the, all they would take for the New York Times is to have a robot.txt file that says, you know, hey, you can't browse it to feed your ChatGPT model. They, they could probably mm. uh, develop a, such a license. Uh, and then they would well, okay, then you're probably going to think I'm nuts, but um, I have, w with a company, I have created Kawasaki GPT. Kawasaki GPT has everything that I have written, including the books. I didn't tell my publishers, but I put the books in there. <laughs> and, and it also has the transcripts of every Remarkable People podcast. So it has Jane Goodall talking for an hour. It has Stephen Wolfram talking for an hour. It has everybody. And I can tell you that with total certainty, if any of you ever wanted to ask Guy a question, if you go to Kawasaki GPT and ask that question, you will get a better answer than if I answered. There's no doubt. In fact, I go to my own site and ask myself questions <laughs> because it gives me better answers than I would, I swear, than I would craft. And, and so now, like, like, people tell me, you know, guy, like, well, what happens when people go to chat GPT and they say, how many slides should be in a pitch? And the answer comes back, 10, Ten. right? 10. Now, aren't you offended that you're the person who wrote the 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint? Shouldn't you get compensated for that? A and I got to tell you, my logic is, listen, I I'm the opposite of those New York Times and the authors. I want my stuff in the LLM because my dream is ChatGPT says, you should use 10 slides according to Guy Kawasaki. But does it reference you? Why not? I mean, but, but does it right now? It can. I don't know if it does. But uh, well, listen. some of them do reference. So if he's published a blog post, what I know, and I know his ten slides, there. So the latest technology is called RAG, right? Retrieval Augmented Generation, where it cites where it got it. So in the Pro version of GPT-4, it does have a citation and a URL. 
and so does perplexity. So it should do that. Well, I don't know. In Kawasaki right GPT, now. there's there's a citation that where it came from. Right, but that's your proprietary model. That's not public. I don't. You, you want distribution, right? <laughs> anyway, I I guess I, you know I have this theory that information wants to be free, and I'm not going to stand in the way of that. Not not my information. You know, I'm speaking only for myself. God bless you. You know, like there's this interesting case now that. There you go. What well, what are you showing me? That's perplexity. And? It's citing you for 10 slides for a pitch deck. Okay, so is it better that it cites me in there than I say, no, 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 perplexity, you can't have my, my information? Well, I, you can't stop perplexity, first of all, so. Well, but theoretically, I, th I think it's better that I'm in it and it cites me than people might say, oh, that's the guy that wrote this next book. Think different, you know, think remarkable. I should buy that book. You're I read getting, his stuff about slides. In this. And if you don't know what perplexity, it is the Google search killer. Do you know perplexity? Raise your hand. Okay, so they just raised a tremendous round. Their lead investor is Jeff Bezos, and Google is extremely scared of them. Perplexity, you should download it or use their website. It's way better than Google search. Most of the AI founders don't use Google search anymore. They okay. use perplexity. That okay, disruptions so already happened. Close, close yeah. to this divergence that we just went on. What, what do both of you think is the role of Wikipedia in a world of LLMs? They need an LLM as fast as possible, or people will just go around it and use another LLM to. I mean, it's already the data's already been grifted off of there and been pre-trained, so they need a new interface. Uh, maybe a J Jimmy Wales GPT, right? They need something <laughs> different. How many of you used Wikipedia as much now as before ChatGPT? No. So you actually go to wikipedia.com and you still search? Really? No, I, I search Wikipedia space yeah. and then what I want. <laughs> and why would you do that instead of just asking ChatGPT, who is Jeff Bezos? Because I normally use Wikipedia actually for math, uh, definitions, yeah. geometry, theorems, uh, facts, uh, and it's extremely good for that, and it's vetted, mm -hmm. and it's very fast. And so, whereas uh, ChatGPT is very good, but hallucinates, and I prefer fewer hallucinations in my theorems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. LLMs are not great at math. Uh, um, so, I in your world, what do you view as the role of universities in this coming tsunami of AI? Somehow I don't think it will be very much changed because, you know, what is a university? It's essentially a place where people learn skills that are going to be competitive in the rest of the employment that they're going to face, you know? Uh, they, we, we like to think that, that things have a, a proper level, like uh, to be graduating from UCSC, you have to know at this level. But if we were teaching monkeys, the level would be lower, and if we were teaching, you know, the level is measured compared to what people can do. I mean, we live in a competitive world in the end. And so having some competitive knowledge advantage, uh, breadth of knowledge uh, and skills uh, will always be valuable. You know, it won't go away simply because now there is AI that makes everybody more efficient in various ways. I mean, the content of some things might change, but the general advantage, in fact, of, of, of a great education may be only magnified. Why? Because you are able to leverage uh, better the tools uh, that now we have at your disposal. Huh. I mean, it's generally worked uh, that way, right? Uh, if, you, if you go back uh, to pre-industrial times, uh, people had more similar standards of living, basically, you know? And, uh, and uh, what we are creating is ways of being efficient that not everybody can reap. Uh, and, and, and so I think uh, uh, my concern is the opposite, you know, that uh, the, the divergence between uh, the winners and uh, the average will be larger. Larger? Larger than it is now, not smaller. Huh. Well, what do you think, Jeremiah? Um, I, I leave, he works in the space. I don't have a real comment. But I think, I mean, if knowledge is so easy to obtain, then, you know, the experiences or the connections or the... The network that the university offers, I think, is going to be so much more important that you can't get from AI. Okay, fair enough. Listen, I've dominated the questions long enough. How about some questions from the audience? Just about that. 
ask that, pose that. I think, you know, oh, talking you about see. the future of the university is probably a very appropriate place to, to open it up to the All audience. All right. So, please. There's a hand Put, here. Put a hand right here. Do we have a mic? <laughs> probably need a probably need a runner. Uh, Mal Kiat Sandu, I teach finance and international business here at a number of the places. But one of the things we always teach in macroeconomics is that um, well, just take a look. We have more technology than ever before, and we have more people employed than ever before. And the migration of human beings has always been towards the machines, towards the technology. And when I look at what we're talking about here, and I, I do kind of side with the, the, the whole idea that it can be more unfair. For people who use AI in the proper way, they can become much more productive and then also then much more commanding of income and wealth. And then people who use it just as a, as a way to solve like lazy problems will fade further back into being less commanding of income and wealth. So I just wanted to agree because, but I don't know if we should be scared of this because I have a lot of problems. I use Canvas, I was talking about this earlier. And I see stuff on Canvas and I go, why can't, why can't an AI fix my deadlines? I <laughs> exported from fall to, to winter and the deadlines are all messed up. Now I gotta go back. It would be much better that I could, if I could just think about having good um, AI conversations in class rather than spending hours and hours fixing these minor like, you know, annoyances that could maybe be solved by something like an AI, you know, uh, helper somewhere. So I think, I, I, just, I just wanted to say that I think that uh, we, we might be fearful, but um, we should take a look back and say, usually technology has made things better, hasn't it? And, mm. or, I mean, oh, you, might, you might have the fear, but uh, I, I, I drive by, when I come here, I, I drive by Intuitive Surgical. You guys know what that one is, don't you? The, uh, the, the, uh, the Da Vinci robot company? Yeah. If something like this can make a surgeon better, make it easier for them to operate and get me out of the hospital faster and you know, treat and look for cancer much more quickly. I mean, I think that would be a better place, wouldn't it? Rather than you know, not allowing the technology to do that kind of stuff. So that's kind of just, I just wanted to make that statement. But there's a, wasn't there some famous study where they examined um, radiologists, right? And it was like, I don't know, some huge percentage missed Miss tumors or something, and and the and the, uh, the and the technology caught them all or something like that. There's been a couple of studies. Yeah. 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 Let me put the, the good of AI in another sense. We, you know that uh, the birth rate is dropping in uh, evolved countries, right? So if you read the, the projections, uh, you in in a couple of centuries there will be a small percentage of humanity left, apparently. And the problem is that things like iPhones and things like computers uh, take a very large industrial base to produce. You know, I don't know how many million people, but, but you know, the, the we have been able to produce maybe one or two such chains that produce these things. And uh, you need the people to produce uh, the things uh, that, you know, etch the wafers and everything else. And then, we, you know, they need to be able to buy food. and. Uh, it's not clear that humanity can so easily survive if, if it reduces by a hand factor of a hundred, uh, which is in the forecasts for the next uh, two, three centuries at most. Mm -hmm. And so AI may be essential as a way to increase productivity in a lot of fields uh, for us to be able to frankly survive if that really happens. <laughs> so, uh, just as an orthogonal thought, right, about what the future uh, reserves for us. Questions? Hi, my name is Conrad. I work over the hill in the applied maths department doing deep learning theory research, so more of the technical side of things. You mentioned that all information should be free, you believe, but most of these models are locked away in a specific server room, and they are entirely based on API access that is paid. That's mostly due to the legal situation where no one can own the specific trained AI, and if someone releases it, it's free for the public. Do you believe that 
legal situation will stay the same, or do you think in the future we'll see people trademarking AI and specifically owning that orientation of ChatGPT once it's been trained? Can, can I take some of that? You're going to have to repeat. You know, um, I'm going to violate all HIPAA regulations right now. So I am deaf. And the reason why I can have any kind of conversation is I have a cochlear implant. And so I have a direct line that skips my inner ear, goes directly to my brain. But the cochlear implant technology is not. It took, it took me from deaf to lousy hearing. It doesn't take you from deaf to good hearing. So basically, I'm telling you all this because I don't know what you asked. <laughs> so can somebody tell me what he asked? <laughs> yeah, he was commenting that most of the open AI, those systems are proprietary and the data is locked behind a firewall with paid API access. And he was questioning if you do believe that that should be free. The other context is if those GPT, if the LLM was made open, then it becomes open source to the public, breaking their business model. Well, <laughs> did I get that right? Yeah. This is, that's, that's Jeremiah GPT. Um, I, I gotta tell you, that's a really tough question because on the one hand, if we take away all incentives to do it, then why do it, right? And on the other hand, if it just becomes the playground of the rich, that's kind of contrary to at least the Santa Cruz way. I don't know about the, you know, Florida way, but anyway, so, but I, I guess my, my impression of how society works is that it, it's not so binary, right? So like, yes, they're going to be greedy capitalist pigs, but there's also going to be Wikipedia and, you know, 700,000 Wikipedians working for free just for the pure love of information. I think there's going to be both. I think there's going to be both. I was curious why you asked that when the, some of the most popular models are open source like Meta's Llama 2 and 3, and then Dubai's Falcon. They're open to the web. I was more interested to see... Excellent. Wait, yes. I'm sorry. The reason I asked is more a, almost a legal question, because as it stands, if someone was able to access ChatGPT and they leaked it to the public, that would be it. There's no legal way to stop that from spreading once it's out in the public. And so I was curious if you, as experts in the field, thought that would remain the case, or? It, I can't imagine it's going to go open source, because they've received funding from uh, VCs and Microsoft. I mean, <coughs> legally, if there will be a change in law that allows people to permanently trademark a neural network. I don't think that's going okay. to happen, because the way the laws are set up specifically from Europe, it's about providing safety measures and checks and checkpoints because they just don't have any control <laughs> over American companies. Yeah. We can talk about Europe's AI scene too and why they're so far behind too. I actually have a kind of follow-up question for this. So the majority defense for AI copyright is if I take a bunch of pictures and I toss them into a collage, which is a giant picture, that's usually covered under fair use. There's an argument that's kind of what AI just do under the, oh, sorry, if I introduce myself, I'm, I work with this department. I'm also a PhD student over the hill. So that's the usual defense. And so a lot of times in the use case for these, I'm making a gen AI model and I want to go and say, make a movie. So some chunk of this is arguably, well, I'm going to make this argument that it's a collage, right? But if I, if I do that, I lose copyright. I can't copyright my collage that's been made from a bunch of other people's pictures. So do you know what's going on in the field about this? Is there a general approach where it's like, well, if we stick enough humans on the end of it, well, you know, now we've made it, we've, now we've made it not fair use for you to just take my thing. So that's Adobe's approach, right? Firefly is building generative images that are rights uh, or original works of art that can be copyrighted for corporations to use, right? So we're already seeing that. And as a result, Getty is following suit. They're taking their vast library of images, which they own, and you can generate it, and you can have a unique image that's trained off that, but you have rights for that. So we're already seeing those business models being upended.
I'd like to ask a question, and, and it's kind of a further follow on that, onto that. And I'm wondering about the role of, of government. Government, you know, maybe idealistically, is meant to represent the interests of the masses against perhaps an overly powerful few. And given how fast, first, how fast things are moving, and second, how unprepared the people who are in government are in understanding these technologies and their implications, is government becoming somewhat irrelevant in this? <laughs> and, and, and how do we recover this equilibrium of power between the, the masses and the few? Can I start? Sure. Did you, thank you. Uh, did you see the White House executive order around AI in November? Y yes. I thought it was pretty thorough and well written. I don't know if they use GPT, um, <laughs> but um, I thought it was pretty thoughtful on thinking about all the permutations and potential risks. Obviously, nothing's going to be implemented, you know, lame duck president, but I, I think they understand the implications. Um, I was concerned at a major AI event in San Francisco. <sighs> one of our one of our Congress persons in Sacramento came, and they didn't really understand AI and they're trying to rule over us and they said, but my aide showed me how to print out the chat GPT and they, she pulled out paper. <laughs> <laughs> so on one hand, I'm okay, they kind of get it, but then, uh, yeah. Yeah, may, it may take ecosystems in great part. So I also was impressed by the AI Act of November. It's the very EO. well done. Yeah. And instead, what worries me more is uh, law, because law is built uh, intrinsically in following precedent. And, uh, and so for things like copyright and intellectual property, uh, where when the president applies to a world that, that is so different from where we are now, yeah. it seems to be uh, a discontinuity that they will have trouble dealing with. I mean, they, they did you, uh, for example, for copyright of images, uh, you know, uh, what, what it, it used to be impossible that if I was a painter and had a certain style such as Miro, for example, you could then generate mirrors by just pressing a button and you would get one a dozen, a dozen every time you press, right? And, and now these type of things are possible. And, and these are collages, uh, but you know, when you, when you used to do a collage, you made one collage. Now you can make a collage and distribute it in ways that is not intended. And the law, embedded in what it said, had an idea about the reality and the use cases that was there before. Now that that has changed, you know, that needs amendment. Yeah, I think your mention of the law versus an executive order is a really important distinction, right? You know, one could be even somewhat afraid of the notion that we are regulating our world through executive order, because what does that even mean from a from a from a societal point of view? Yeah. You you mean executive order versus act of Congress? For example, which is a deliberative body that you know you know idealized. I I, yeah. I accept, but. Um, you know, there's a, and and the whole building of an of a system of laws on precedent, assuming that that is a legitimate and still relevant process. Um, yeah, it's interesting times. You know, I really don't know, and I guess we should think about closing. But I don't know whether to feel incredibly optimistic or incredibly depressed after this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I really don't, and, and, and I think that that's a sign of our times right now that requires us to be deeply engaged with these questions. And so I really want to thank you for, for helping us think about that. And I think, I think we, we in the university have such a responsibility to make sure that all of our students and, all, and therefore all of our faculty are engaged with these questions because it's happening and it's happening to us. And we need to be on top of that. So thank you very much thank to you. our thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.